recording. Welcome to session number three of um, an introduction to worldviews and apologetics, how to understand the way people think about everything and how to talk to them about it. Uh, this is a, a, a session that uh, uh, I've prepared. Uh, I'm Dr. John McMath, um, uh, ex-teacher at the Moody Bible Institute, and I'm joined by my friends in Italy and in the Philippines. And uh, we've been working for a couple of years here uh, in uh, COVID lockdown mode, uh, and uh, now we're all the way up to uh, worldviews and apologetics. And uh, uh, today we'll be looking at the worldview that we call atheism. Now, uh, as I was mentioning before we started recording, <laughs> uh, atheists can be difficult to talk to. Ah, good morning, Oscar. I see you there. How are you, my friend? Atheists can be difficult to talk to. Uh, when I walk into a room full of Christians, uh, it, it, it doesn't matter what languages we all speak. We're all on the same frequency and we can talk to each other about, you know, sometimes we don't talk very well, but we can, we can get along, we can communicate. Uh, with an atheist, um, we're literally on different frequencies. We're talking past each other. Uh, it's almost impossible to understand what they're thinking or why. I'm going to try to introduce some of that today. Um, this is a this is a quick overview, uh, and I'm obviously not going to be able to go over all of the different varieties because, frankly, atheists can't agree with one another about why they don't believe in God. <laughs> they they've got all different sorts of arguments. Uh, none of them are particularly good arguments. Uh, it's easy to defeat the atheist argument. To lead an atheist to Christ requires an act of God. Okay? They're very different things. Uh, the, the fact that I can beat an atheist arguing usually doesn't help in the conversion process. So anyway, that's, that's all introductory stuff. Uh, let me uh, share the screen here, and I want to want to start off with what atheism is, just as a generality. Okay, we're we're going to start out with a quote from Friedrich Nietzsche. Uh, no, this is this cartoon character is supposed to be Friedrich Nietzsche. We'll we'll go on to him after a little bit, uh, but in uh, uh, one of his tractates. Uh, published uh, at the uh, end of the 19th century. Uh, Where is God gone? He called out. I mean to tell you, we have killed him, you and I. We are all his murderers. Do we not hear the noise of the grave diggers who are burying God? God is dead. God remains dead. Okay. So uh, Nietzsche is famous for his, uh, his statement, God is dead. Of course, God is famous for his statement, Nietzsche is dead. Uh, and we've, we've all heard that. Uh, Friedrich Nietzsche is an important character. We're going to come back to him just a, a little bit. Atheists are emphatic and often enthusiastic in their claim that God does not exist. Um, you you wonder why it's so important to them. For example, I don't believe that unicorns exist, uh, but I really don't care if there are little kids who believe in them. Uh, I'm I'm cool with that. I it doesn't affect my life in the least. Uh, if uh, atheists believe that God is in the same category as unicorns then why does it matter to them? <laughs> you know, yeah, I, the, the, if, uh, if God is in the same category as all of the other things that don't matter, then why does it matter? Why, why are they so often so angry about it? Uh, Karl Marx, uh, who uh, like Nietzsche is very important in atheism. Uh, Nietzsche is uh, the patron saint of uh, uh, the Nazis. 
uh, uh, Hitler and a lot of leading uh, Nazi uh, characters uh, were students of, uh, of Nietzsche. Uh, Karl Marx, on the other hand, is the patron saint of communism. Uh, and uh, people like uh, 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 Lenin, obviously, and Stalin, uh, and frankly, uh, uh, Vladimir Putin are devotees of Karl Marx. Uh, and in his Communist Manifesto, uh, Marx wrote, nowadays in our evolutionary conception of the universe, there is absolutely no room for either a creator or a ruler. Uh, they don't want a creator because the creator obviously designed everything. And if you start thinking about a designer for the universe, that's obviously big enough, smart enough, uh, powerful enough to do the job. Uh, then you're talking about God. And a God who is big enough to create the universe is also the king. Uh, and uh, Marx says, in our evolutionary conception of the universe, Karl Marx was writing some 30 years after uh, uh, Charles Darwin published The uh, Origins of the Species. Uh, and uh, Darwin uh, was proud of the fact that he had provided a scientific underpinning for the belief that there is no God. Evolution, a, uh, the idea of the uh, gradual, random uh, change by means of genetic modification over vast amount of times can be an explainer for the apparent design of all of the details of the universe. Uh, traditionally, that rule has been given to God. So uh, the, uh, the atheists are uh, not generally quiet about their position. Uh, they tend to be in your face. They tend to be loud. Okay, polytheism is the idea that there are many many tiny gods, many often irrelevant gods uh, who do all kinds of interesting things, who are basically uh, men and women writ large. Uh, the, the polytheism dominated much of the ancient world uh, from uh, Babylon and Egypt through Greek and Roman thought. The Middle Ages, particularly uh, in Europe, was dominated by uh, Christianity and theism, the belief that the one God outside of the world interacts with the world. Atheism is comparatively modern. Now, there have always been some atheists. Uh, the, uh, the idea goes back to Greek philosophy. We can actually find uh, Greek philosophers who argued that uh, the, the material world is eternal uh, and there, uh, there is no cause. Um, but predominantly, atheism is a modern thing. And in the modern world, there are getting to be an awful lot of active atheists. Now, not all who lack faith like to be called atheists. Some prefer to be called humanist. And it's just a, it's, it's a positive rather than a, than a negative. Atheism is a, a negation. It is the uh, affirmation of the idea that there is no God. Humanism says, I believe that, uh, that man is the center of the universe and, the, and particularly me. <laughs> Atheists won't say that uh, usually out loud, but that's, that's the quiet part. Uh, the, uh, the atheist prefers not to have uh, any superiors uh, over himself or over the government that he creates. Uh, some are best described as materialists. Materialism is the belief that there is nothing in the universe except the material world. There is no supernatural or uh, 
uh, metaphysical world. Uh, all these views, uh, uh, atheism, humanism, and materialism are essentially the same thing. They're all non-theistic, and for the most part, uh, they are actively anti-theistic. They hate God. Uh, an atheist of whatever he calls himself believes there is no God of any sort, either in or beyond the world. Uh, nothing exists but the material world, if even the material world can be said to exist. Uh, when, when you get to the existentialist atheists, uh, like um, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, he even doubts that anything outside of his own mind exists. A very interesting uh, way of thinking, if you can call it thinking. Um, atheists uh, need to be compared with agnostics and skeptics. Uh, now, all of them are uh, non-theistic uh, uh, for the, the most part. Agnostics and skeptics uh, also don't follow God. They don't want to be religious. They have no interest in the church. But to be precise, the skeptic says, I doubt that God exists. Skepticism is from, a, as I recall, a Greek root that uh, uh, refers to doubt. The agnostic is, is another Greek root. The A is the alpha primitive. Gnostic is the Greek word for no, for no something. So I don't know if God exists uh, or some versions of agnosticism uh, say, I can't know if God exists. Uh, there, are, there are two kinds of agnosticism. There's soft agnosticism and hard ag agnosticism. Uh, a, a soft agnosticism is actually a good thing. I don't know uh, is a, a perfectly honest response. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, do you understand uh, differential equations? Uh, the honest answer from me would be, I don't know anything about differential equations. <laughs> okay, but I wouldn't argue that differential equations are unknowable because I happen to know people who understand differential equations. So I'm okay was saying differential equations exist. I simply don't understand them. That's a kind of agnosticism that I think is uh, honest. Uh, the, uh, the skeptic who doubts the existence of God um, is also being honest with us. Uh, and uh, I can have a certain amount of respect for a skeptic. Uh, because a certain amount of skepticism is um, really quite healthy. Uh, if, if I were to walk into the room and claim to be God, you would be correct in being skeptical <laughs> because I'm not God. Uh, and uh, you should doubt that I am. The atheist, on the other hand, says, I know and I can prove that God does not exist. So he's not saying, I've got my doubts, or I just don't know yet. He says, oh, I know this. I can prove this. This is, ab this is a slam dunk, to use basketball terminology. I absolutely know, uh, can absolutely prove that God does not exist. Um, much of what ties the atheist, the skeptic, and the agnostic together come from uh, uh, the philosophy of the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is a roughly 200 years of uh, philosophical uh, work that took place after the time of the Reformation. So we have Renaissance, Reformation, and then the, uh, the Enlightenment. And Enlightenment is a time, there's a lot of good that comes out of the Enlightenment. Uh, the, uh, the church was actually really hard on uh, intellectuals and scientists and uh, philosophers. Uh, and the ability to get out from under that was actually a, a, a good thing.
but the atheists really went uh, too far. Uh, David Hume is a British philosopher of the 1700s uh, who argued that, uh, among other things, uh, cause and effect uh, don't exist, or at least we can't, we can't demonstrate it. Uh, uh, I walk out onto a soccer field and uh, give the soccer ball a mighty kick and it goes up into the air and, uh, and lands uh, very close to the goal. And uh, one of my teammates uh, kicks it on into the goal. Oh, great play, right? Well, David Hume would say, there's no necessary relationship between your great kick and the flight of that soccer ball. To imply that your kick caused the ball to fly through the air and land down by the net uh, is taking it too far. You just can't know. Um, his argument is beyond us. I'm, I'm not going to take us through the, the philosophy of David Hume, but that's his really important point. Uh, if you can't argue from cause and effect, then when you're looking at the universe, what you're seeing is an effect. Here is this orderly, enormous, obviously well-regulated thing, this existing thing, and you can't deny meaningfully that the universe exists. Uh, and we know in classical philosophy that every effect has a cause that explains it. So it's easy to argue from the effect to the cause and argue for the existence of God. Hume said, you can't do that. That's improper. <laughs> All right. Immanuel Kant is a German philosopher, again, of the 1700s, uh, who uh, uh, argues that uh, uh, truth is ultimately unknowable. Uh, that using nothing but my pure human reason, I can never arrive at the truth. I can never know anything for sure. Uh, and, uh, so his, his position is the classic uh, agnosticism, hard agnosticism. Nothing can ever be known for sure. And of course, if nothing can be known, then God cannot be known. Uh, uh, David Hume essentially uh, lays the foundations for skepticism. Uh, did this cause that? Hume would say, I doubt it. <laughs> we can't know. You can't tie them together. Okay, so Hume and Kant lay a lot of the philosophical basis. Uh, and uh, atheism, in the modern sense, uh, along with Marxism and evolutionism and the, uh, the rest of it, uh, communism and Nazism, they, they, they all fit together uh, because they all develop from the notion uh, that truth is relative, knowledge is subjective, it only exists inside my own head. Uh, and we're each in this alone and with no purpose. Uh, and have to find our own way in the world. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a ultimately a fairly depressing philosophy. Okay, the Bible, of course, has a little bit to say about atheists. Uh, there are three kinds of people who may, one way or another, uh, deny God. The first is the naive, or the uh, the simple. Proverbs one four. Uh, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth, and so on. Uh, the simple is the, the young, impressionable, growing boy or girl uh, who hasn't learned much of anything yet. Uh, the, uh, the naive or simple is young and untaught. Good teaching will help him grow up. Uh, they, the whole point of the book of Proverbs is to provide wisdom to the young. Listen to your mother's instruction and to your father's discipline, you know, that you may grow up wise. Um, 
it's a great book. Uh, and the, uh, the point of the exercise is that uh, the young are naturally not very advanced in their thinking. They need to be taught. Uh, and uh, sometimes you'll find young people who don't believe in God because they've never been taught. Uh, they have no idea. They can be taught. Uh, this is uh, this is one of the reasons that I like to do ministry amongst families. Uh, I, I love to introduce the gospel to children uh, because when you teach them, uh, they can see how obvious the truth is, uh, and they just grow up with it. It's, it's it's very important to teach children. Now, a second kind of atheist, uh, the Psalms call the fool, the fool says in his heart, quote, there is no God, unquote. Uh, I, <laughs> I was arguing with somebody once, once upon a time uh, who said, well, even the Bible says there is no God. Uh, yes, I know. Uh, Psalm 14, one, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Uh, the fool is an interesting character uh, in the uh, in the biblical passages that that deal with him, the uh, the fool has very little time for God, and he has chosen to live life as though there is no God. Uh, generally speaking, the fool needs to be broken before he can be taught. Uh, uh, sometimes we talk about letting the fool hit rock bottom uh, in, a, a, in a halfway house or in prison or wherever. Uh, and uh, several of my friends have uh, pursued prison ministry for exactly that reason. Uh, the fool trying to live as though there were no God is often going to get in trouble. If there is no God, then there is no law, and there and I, I can do anything I want to do. Well, that's a that's a good way to get yourself in trouble. Uh, the uh, uh, the fool generally has not arrived at his position by reason. He just likes his sin. Uh, he he likes to do his sin undisturbed by his conscience, as though he will often not listen to argument and will consider the believer who is trying to talk to him to be the fool in this matter. Uh, and I've, I've worked with a lot of those. Uh, and, uh, when, uh, uh, when, you're, uh, when you're working with somebody who, who just isn't interested, who, just, uh, who has no argument, uh, but who just is not interested in talking about it, you're talking to a fool. And uh, he's usually got a sin problem. He's eventually going to get in bad trouble. Uh, and at that point, uh, somebody might be able to get through to him. A fool will often be confirmed into the, the full-scale atheist. Uh, uh, but uh, his sin will take him to hell uh, if he's not careful. Sometimes God reaches out to these people. Uh, and uh, when somebody that you know is a fool starts coming around answer, uh, asking questions that they really want answers for. Uh, it is good to stop what you're doing and answer their questions uh, because uh, uh, that's the way you can tell that a fool is getting ready to make some kind of a change. Do you want to be there for him when he does? The mocker or the scoffer uh, like uh, like Second Peter uh, three three, knowing this first of all that scoffers will come in the last days with their scoffing, following their own sinful desires. Well, sometimes we call it in the Proverbs. We, uh, we sometimes see the mocker. Uh, in the New Testament, the term is usually translated scoffer. It doesn't matter. They're both the same guy. Uh, the mocker or the scoffer has given the matter some thought, and he believes he has a good argument uh, for the absence of God in his life. He obviously has no God and doesn't want to know God, 
uh, uh, but the the scoffer is unique in that he has thought the matter through. He's thought about his position, and he's chosen to believe that there is no God. He enthusiastically teaches anyone who will listen. He is often hostile to the believer. The scoffer cannot be taught. Uh, I don't bother arguing with a scoffer unless I've got a larger audience that I think might benefit. Uh, the, the scoffer has chosen hell uh, and he's, uh, he, he's on his way and working hard on uh, getting there. He wants to live eternity without God. Uh, and uh, um, uh, the scoffers are very, very difficult to get through to. Uh, uh, even when you beat them in a debate, uh, they, uh, they don't come around. I've never seen one come around. Okay, some variations on the theme. There's a whole bunch of different ways of being an atheist. Uh, traditional atheism uh, is uh, fairly broad. It denies that God is, ever was, or ever shall be. There never was a God. There won't ever be a God. Uh, Feuerbach, uh, Marx, Sartre, Anthony Flew, and a lot of others fit this title. Uh, the mythological atheist uh, also agrees that there never was a God, but he would hold that the God myth once had some value. There was a time uh, when people may have uh, needed the idea of God, but that's that's over with. Now we've got science and philosophy. Friedrich Nietzsche is the uh, the main one there. Uh, semantical atheists argue that God talk is dead. <laughs> In other words, God is irrelevant. Uh, there may be a God, it doesn't matter, talking about him is meaningless. Uh, the modern philosopher Paul Ben Buren, who we won't look at, uh, is an example of semantical atheism. Uh, traditional atheism is a metaphysical system, a philosophy which speaks of that which is beyond the physical. That's what metaphysics means. That means that a real atheist has thought about the reasons for his position, as opposed to the practical atheist who simply lives as though there is no God. <clears throat> so a real atheist is actually kind of a rare bird, uh, and they're often very entertaining, uh, but, uh, but they're definitely wrong, and they're in bad trouble. Okay, some representatives. We'll start out with Nietzsche. Uh, Nietzsche is recent enough in history that we actually have some photographs of him. Uh, he died in 1900 in Germany. Uh, he's one of the most colorful advocates of atheism. He was raised, of course, in, in Germany. He was raised in a Lutheran home, but he rebelled violently against his uh, early training. Uh, concerning uh, God, Nietzsche believed that God did not and never had existed. Uh, he built his argument on uh, several pillars. Uh, he said, first of all, it is impossible for there to be a self-caused being. Uh, uh, Nietzsche believed uh, that, uh, uh, that Christians were arguing that uh, God had caused himself. Now, of course, no well-educated Christian has ever argued such a thing, but some people probably have said that. Uh, his second argument uh, is uh, uh, actually the more powerful, and we see it uh, in atheist arguments into the present day. Uh, there is evil in the world. Uh, this photograph of the, uh, the death camps in Nazi Germany which I, I find ironic uh, because the Nazis loved Nietzsche. But Nietzsche said, well, just look at the world. There is evil in the world. Uh, and if there were a good God, he wouldn't like that. Uh, and if there were a powerful God, uh, he could do something about it. Uh, and uh, uh, therefore, there is no God. Or at least uh, the biblical God doesn't exist. Uh, there's a good counter argument for that, and we'll look at that as we get further along. Then uh, thirdly, the God idea 
is merely psychological. Uh, the notions of psychology were just beginning during the lifetime of, uh, of Nietzsche. The idea that uh, there, there's something subjective going on inside our minds uh, that is separate from our bodies. Uh, and uh, uh, Nietzsche uh, said, um, uh, in essence, uh, if there, uh, if there, if nobody had ever come up with the idea of God, we would we would invent him because uh, we f we feel the need for someone to look up to. He's thought that the old God myth had dominated the Middle Ages. It fallen into decay with the rise of modern thinking. It believed that man no longer needed the psychological crutch of God and should just move on. Uh, this third idea is uh, is still very common amongst uh, atheists. You'll see a lot of it. Ethics. Uh, since there is no God, according to Nietzsche, all God-based values and absolutes had also died. So there are no rights and wrongs. There are no absolutes in ethics. He rejected traditional Judeo-Christian values. He preferred the manly virtues of harshness and suspicion. And again, the Nazis loved this guy. Uh, he was uh, he was their kind of guy. Um, there's a, a part of this that is uh, uh, really quite difficult uh, for the atheist. So if there is no God, there are no rights and wrongs. There are no goods and evils. So how does the argument there is evil in the world make any sense uh, by by whose judgment is there evil in the world <laughs> by by your your judgment uh, uh, brother nietzsche uh what if my judgment is different than your judgment uh, you know if there is no absolute standard how do you know that the world contains evil that he didn't, he never bothered answering that uh, concerning man man is mortal and there is no afterlife uh, a man is uh, uh, is born a purely material being once uh, once he dies he's gone forever so because there is no god and there are no standards in the universe, men must create their own values. They must learn to overcome the meaninglessness and the emptiness of life and become supermen. <laughs> That's, this is really Nietzsche's uh, uh, term. The, uh, the German is Ubermensch. Uh, and uh, uh, what we become is uh, a, uh, a is men with a with uh, with meaning of some sort. We invent our own meanings, our own values. Okay, uh, concerning the world, <coughs> since there is no God, the world is all there is. This big blue marble is it. We must reject God as the declaration of a war against life, a war against nature. So, uh, so God is against life, he's against nature. We must remain faithful to the earth. For Nietzsche, the earth is literally all there is. There isn't anything else. There are no greater principles. Uh, so in many ways, Nietzsche was the original environmentalist. Uh, this uh, belief that the material world is all there is or will ever be. Uh, so if we lose this, it's all over, is a distinctly atheistic notion. Environmentalism is traditionally an atheistic movement. Now, uh, Christian stewardship of uh, the land and water and so on uh, is a different concept that goes back to the uh, the notion of man's dominion over the earth. But that's a God-given set of principles. And uh, in general, atheists will reject that. Okay, what is history about? History is cyclical. It's one thing after another. It goes round and round she goes, and it repeats itself over and over again. There is no goal or purpose in 
history. A man lives his life and nothing. He disappears. He must do what he can to make his own meaning. Uh, it's all about me and my stuff. He who dies with the most toys wins. Uh, and there is no meaning in life. Okay, that's, that's Nietzsche. Uh, I find uh, Nietzsche uh, profoundly pessimistic and uh, discouraging. Ludwig Feuerbach, also German, uh, died in 1872, student of Hegel, another of the Enlightenment philosophers. Uh, Hegel was, uh, uh, along with Hume and Kant, uh, important in the development of uh, atheism. Feuerbach made his mark by his unique denial of God within the Hegelian frame of reference. Karl Marx also used Feuerbach's philosophy to develop what we call dialectical materialism, which is the so-called philosophic uh, base of uh, communism. Uh, so concerning God, God is nothing more than a projection of human imagination. Uh, just that's it. Uh, according to uh, uh, Feuerbach, uh, man created God in his own image. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, there is no God and uh, uh, men wanted one. So they created a God who's just a significant man. Well, what about man then? Well, man is an animal who has reached self-consciousness. Uh, the other day, uh, we, were, we were trying to get our granddaughter to watch a cartoon movie, The 101 Dalmatians. And uh, you know, here's a couple of Dalmatian dogs who've got better sense than most people. Uh, the, the point of uh, uh, Feuerbach's uh, atheism is that man has reached a level of self-consciousness without the ability to reflect on and project on his own nature and call it God, there would be no religion. So we're just thinking of ourselves and wondering what it would like be like to be really, really big or powerful or knowledgeable or whatnot, and we call that God. That's all there is to religion. Ethics uh, was an attempt for uh, Feuerbach uh, to redirect eth ethics from heaven to earth. Uh, he said, stop trying to attain heaven and try to make things better on the earth. And we were to find this all over the place. This is, this is the basis of uh, uh, every kind of social welfare program uh, that the non-Christian world likes to do. Now, we Christians do these things. Uh, this particular uh, food line from the Great Depression uh, was being run by a church. Uh, but uh, Fairbach would say, uh, do your good deeds here because there's nothing waiting for you in heaven. Okay, so what is, uh, uh, what is history all about? According to Fairbach, History reveals nothing more than man's progressive self-understanding. Religion was a necessary evil along the way, he says, as man projected the best of himself uh, on reality and called it God. <coughs> so a man begins to worship himself. Um, and that actually is probably close to the truth. Okay, more recent, uh, died in 1980, a French philosopher, Jean-Paul Sartre. Uh, this, uh, this form of uh, atheism is often called existential atheism. Uh, Sartre and Albert Camus are two of the most famous literary uh, uh, existential atheists. Existentialism is almost entirely a literary phenomenon. Uh, the, uh, uh, the writers who uh, have gone this direction do stream of consciousness, and all kinds of weird stuff in uh, uh, very edgy literature. Um, existentialism is hard to understand. Uh, somebody said, I was listening to a video a while back. If you think you understand existentialism, you're missing the point. 
because if you think you understand it, the, the whole point of existentialism is that nothing can ever be understood. So if you think you've got a handle on that, uh, you're missing it. Uh, uh, he's, he's really right. Um, so Sartre, what about God? Well, Sartre also rejected the idea of a self-caused being. Oh, good for him. Uh, he shares this with many other atheists. And uh, that's pretty much the extent of his understanding of theistic argument. Uh, for uh, Sartre, man is a useless passion, an empty bubble on the sea of nothingness. Oh, that's encouraging. Man's basic project is to become God. But that's impossible because men are contingent beings or caused beings. And a contingent being can never become a necessary being. <coughs> that's philosopher talk for uh, those of us who are finite can never be infinite. Man is absolutely free, Sartre says, in his subjective being. Now, subjective being is uh, an important part of existentialism. Uh, subjective and objective refer to what is inside my head, which is subjective, and objective, that which actually exists in the real world. Uh, so uh, Sartre would see the two poles, the subjective and the objective. And he says the objective has no existence outside of my subjective experience of it. As a matter of fact, I can never prove that the objective world actually exists. All that really exists is what's going on in my own head. What I personally think I'm experiencing, uh, and I may or may not be actually experiencing anything, but whatever I think is true. Uh, even if it contradicts everything that anybody else has ever thought in all of uh, history, because history doesn't exist. Other people don't exist. Nothing exists except what's going on in my own head. Uh, so a man is condemned to, to freedom. That's a, a famous line. Here's a quote. The individual's duty <coughs> is to do what he wants to do, to think whatever he likes to be accountable to no one but himself, to challenge every idea and every person. Absolute freedom uh, is uh, the hallmark of existentialism. So where do you go with ethics? There aren't any absolutes. There are no objective moral prescriptions. This is uh, Sartre. Uh, and uh, sorry for the translation. It's uh, uh, French doesn't translate very well. I was like a man who's lost his shadow, and there was nothing left in heaven, uh, no right or wrong, no anyone to give me orders. For I, Zeus, am a man, and every man must find his own way. So there are no objective values. Uh, according to Sartre, it, it, it amounts to the same thing whether one gets drunk alone or is the leader of nations. We must accept the basic absurdity and subjectivity of life. Okay? Absurdity and subjectivity. To, uh, to call the universe absurd is to assert that there is no meaning. <coughs> subjectivity is the argument that all of reality exists inside my own head. And even that is absurd. So how should we live? And the answer is any way you want. Whatever you choose is good. It just doesn't matter at all. You'll choose to do whatever you want, um, find your own meaning in life, uh, and that's the end of that. Another quote from, uh, from Sartre that pretty much lays it out. If God doesn't exist, everything is permitted. Uh, we wonder why in the modern world uh, uh, such horrible things happen. Uh, well, if God doesn't exist, there are no rules. There are no laws. 
there are no absolutes. Uh, and this has, uh, uh, <clears throat> has played a chord in the modern world. Uh, there are lots and lots of people out there who think this is just fine. Okay, the world and destiny, where, where is it going? Uh, the world for Sartre is real, but meaningless. It's real in the sense that it exists in my head, but it's meaningless. It's, uh, it, it's uh, sound and fury without any meaning. It's simply there, has no meaning. It is absurd. Each man must revolt against the absurdity and create his own meaning. Uh, this quote I liked, every existing thing is born without reason, prolongs itself out of weakness, and dies by chance. <clears throat> so wh what is it all about? Nothing. Nothing at all. It is utterly meaningless. Okay. <laughs> As, like I often say with, with stuff like this, therefore encourage one another with these words. I find atheism a very discouraging uh, worldview. Uh, basic beliefs. Uh, the arguments for atheism are largely negative. They, they really come down to arguments against theism. And if you want to look through the arguments, they're uh, they're interesting, uh, but the conversation comes down to an understanding of basic arguments for God's existence and the atheist counter arguments. So we're going to look at the traditional arguments, uh, and these come down to, there's actually a lot more, they, this, this can get very complex, but the, the cosmological argument, the teleological argument, the ontological argument, and the moral argument. Uh, and they all have their pluses and minuses. They all have their uses. The cosmological argument is uh, from the Greek word cosmos or world. Uh, and it started, Thomas Aquinas was famous for this. Uh, he said uh, uh, the world obviously exists as the universe obviously exists. Everything that exists but might not exist requires a cause. So step number one, Every effect has a cause. Step number two, the universe is an effect. Therefore, the universe has a cause. That's the cosmological argument in a nutshell. It's actually expanded quite a bit. Uh, people like uh, 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 Descartes uh, use the cosmological argument to great, to, uh, great effect uh, because, the, because it's obvious. Uh, in order to explain an, uh, a complex and non-trivial effect, you need a complex non-trivial cause because every effect has a cause, all right? And the, uh, the first cause of a sequence of complex non-trivial effects has to be bigger than all of them put together, uh, <clears throat> uh, literally infinite. <clears throat> That's the cosmological argument. The teleological argument is often confused with the cosmological argument. Uh, telos is end or purpose and is really the argument from design. Uh, so the uh, first statement in the teleological argument is every design has a designer. Okay. And the better the design, the better the designer. Uh, and, uh, 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 things that actually work don't work because of an accident. Uh, something, uh, uh, something deliberate has happened here. The agency of a designer is obvious. The, the universe uh, obviously manifests design. Therefore, the universe has a designer who is best thought of as God. This is William Paley and the watchmaker. Uh, you walk through the forest and see a complex um, watch on the ground. You don't automatically assume that the watch grew there or evolved out of the slime mold under a nearby tree. Uh, you assume that someone dropped it there and that that watch was originally built by a watchmaker. Uh, so we call this Paley's watchmaker, and it's the teleological argument. 
uh, the ontological argument is probably the most esoteric of the uh, uh, the, uh, theistic arguments. (coughs) Goes all the way back to a Uh, an early uh, scholastic from uh, Oxford University, St. Anselm, who was writing for other monks at the time. And he came up with the ontological argument. Uh, God is, by definition, an absolutely perfect being. Okay? So if you're going to talk about God, what you're talking about is an absolutely perfect being. Step two, an absolutely perfect being cannot lack anything. Because if it lacked anything, it could it could develop and grow and get better. But it's perfect already, so it lacks nothing. The third point, but a being that exists has something that a being that does not exist lacks, namely existence. So obviously a God who exists is more perfect than a God who doesn't exist. Therefore, an absolutely perfect being must exist. <clears throat> the ontological argument is often criticized. Hey, we're not going to go into the criticisms of the ontological argument. Uh, it is, in fact, uh, a very good argument, uh, but frankly, it's not one that was designed to use with non-Christians. Uh, <laughs> St. Anselm was trying to help other monks uh, be rational. Nevertheless, that argument uh, still has legs today. It's, a, it's actually a very good argument. It's literally unanswerable, uh, but it doesn't convince atheists. None of these do. The moral argument from C.S. Lewis is uh, one of my favorite arguments. Uh, uh, everybody seems to realize, this is point number one, that there are objective moral laws. I look around the world and uh, we generally agree that murder is wrong. Uh, in our modern world, the existentialist would even say that murder isn't always wrong, but that, <clears throat> but we seem to, we tend to agree. Uh, the, uh, the atheist argues that because of evil in the world, well, what is evil? Well, you know, I may not be able to define it, but I know it when I see it, <clears throat> that's not a good argument. Uh, you know, is uh, uh, little children dying of starvation a good thing or a bad thing? Oh, well, it's a bad thing. The question becomes, how do you know? Well, it's just obviously bad. Okay. If there are objective moral laws to the extent that you can tell that starving children is not a good thing, then moral laws exist. But step number two, moral laws have to come from a moral lawgiver. Uh, If those were all subjective, if everybody just picked and chose which moral laws they thought were good ones, we'd have all different sorts of ideas. But we all agree that starving children is a bad thing. Therefore, a moral lawgiver exists. This is the argument from C.S. Lewis. Uh, and is uh, a very common argument today. <clears throat> uh, to go back to the teleological argument, I'm going to show you a video. <clears throat> Some of you have seen this, uh, and I'm not showing this because I'm a Honda uh, fan necessarily. And I don't think my, uh, I don't think the uh, sound is going to work on this. Oh, oh. And as a matter of fact, nothing is working on this. This is called the Honda Cog. Uh, And uh, this was done, oh, some 20 years ago by engineers in the Honda factory. It took them some six months to take apart a Honda automobile, one of the prototypes, uh, and uh, lay it out in order so that it would do this sequence, which is kind of fun to watch. I still haven't figured out how they got those wheels to roll uphill. And then the seats go up, and that sets the wipers rolling, and the oil falls, and the roller bearings slowly drop into the cylinders. The battery goes up, starts the fan, which rolls until it unplugs, bumps into a support that knocks over a muffler, 
which rolls just exactly far enough to bump these other things which start this going. There's a couple of piston rods banging into something else that makes the window go down, starts the spray, and the wipers sense the presence of the water, which starts the fan of windows, which knocks over that thing, which causes a connection, which turns on the radio, which plays the music, which knocks the spring off the glass, which pushes the button on the key fob, closes the door, which unbalances the Honda, and down it rolls <clears throat> to stop in front of us. And the uh, uh, narrator behind says, isn't it nice when things just work? <laughs> Okay, well, things don't just work. Uh, the, uh, the universe is obviously complex, uh, just as nobody would believe that the engineers at Honda were able to set that up and make it happen the very first time they tried. They didn't. <laughs> it took them a long time to make that work once. Uh, the universe is infinitely complex. Uh, and it's a, it's a serious problem for the atheist. Okay, summary of atheist objections. And I'm just gonna walk through these uh, briefly uh, uh, because these are, these are, there are, uh, uh, are fundamental arguments and we're, we can go through every one of them. Uh, number one, the first cause. And uh, here they're arguing about the, uh, the Christian's argument that the first cause uh, has to be God. Uh, and the atheist would say, well, the first cause can be finite. Uh, uh, if the universe has a cause, it doesn't need to be infinite. The universe is finite, so the cause only has to be ever so slightly bigger than the universe. Uh, secondly, uh, even if the universe has a cause, it doesn't have to be perfect since obviously the world is imperfect. <clears throat> and I always like to, to ask an atheist, uh, how do you know that the world is imperfect? Well, it's obvious. I, yes, I, I agree. But how do you know if there is no infinitely perfect standard? How, how do you know? Well, they never have an answer, but that doesn't usually change anything. Uh, thirdly, uh, chance can explain the design. The apparent design in the world has arisen by evolution. So random chance explains a brilliantly uh, complex design. Uh, fourthly, uh, we can't prove causality. Cause, uh, cause and effect uh, are an illusion. Uh, it's only a coincidence that that soccer player swings his foot and the ball happens to rocket into the goal. <clears throat> it's an illusion. Uh, five, in an infinite series, uh, an infinite series of causes is reasonable. We can just keep going back. Uh, the, uh, the atheist says there doesn't have to be a first cause. Uh, it, it can be a circle of causes. It can be a, an infinite cycle of causes. There doesn't, he doesn't have a problem with that. Uh, six, there is no such thing as necessary. Nothing is necessary. Nothing exists necessarily. Uh, the atheist would argue, I can always conceive of something, including God, as not existing. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, the seventh, uh, the universe as a whole doesn't need a cause. Only the parts need causes. That's an interesting argument, by the way. They would argue that the universe as a whole was never caused and needs no cause. It just exists. Uh, uh, eight, the logically necessary does not necessarily exist. This, this one is an answer to the ontological argument uh, because the, uh, the existence of God is logically necessary from the definition of God. Uh, 
is like uh, triangles. Uh, the uh, a, a triangle has uh, uh, three sides, uh, but the fact that a triangle must necessarily have three sides doesn't mean that a triangle necessarily exists. Uh, and there's a good argument to that one too, but we're not going to go there right now. Uh, and then nine is uh, the existentialist uh, part of atheism. There is a gulf between what is objectively and what I perceive subjectively. There's an insurpassable gulf between the thing to me, what I experience in the appearance and the thing in itself. I can never know the reality, only the experience that I'm having at the at the instant. So uh, those are the those are the nine major things. Atheists uh, have devised a variety of different uh, approaches, cosmological, teleological, ontological counter arguments to God's existence. But the moral argument is the most uh, uh, powerful. Uh, and it's a stupid argument, but let's let's look at it. If God were good, he would destroy evil. Okay. If God were powerful, he could destroy evil, but evil exists. Therefore, God does not exist. This continues to be used right into the present day. Uh, Richard Dawkins, The God Delusion, uses this argument. Uh, it, uh, it's a very popular argument. I can destroy each and every line of this, but we're not going to bother with that right now. Uh, let's look at the whole list of what atheism actually teaches. Uh, the uh, uh, fundamental, God does not exist. Okay, there, there is, is not now and never has been a God. The world is eternal. Uh, Carl Sagan, this character on the right, uh, argues the cosmos is all there is, all there was, all there ever will be. Uh, he could put an amen there. <coughs> uh, Carl Sagan died in 1980. Uh, so I have a hunch by now uh, he knows better. Uh, thirdly, atheists agree that evil exists. Uh, now that's inconsistent uh, because if there is no God, there are no absolute standards. And how can evil exist if there are no standards? But there it is, evil exists. Typically that's uh, 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 inconsistent with their own personal ideas of good and evil. Uh, fourthly, man is material. He is nothing more than matter in motion. And when he dies, he dies. He's just gone. Uh, uh, ethics for the atheist are entirely relative. There are no moral absolutes. And man's destiny, therefore, is death. Uh, as a race, as a human race, we can attain to utopian paradise through psychological determinism, B.F. Skinner and the other psychologists, uh, or the economic dialectic of history, which is Karl Marx. Uh, we can achieve utopia by our own uh, uh, efforts, even though uh, we won't live to see it. Okay. This is Carl Sagan. The cosmos is all that is, was, or ever shall be. I love that stuff. Okay, an evaluation of atheism, because everything that we're going to look at has got its, has got its good points. One, atheists are correct in affirming the presence of evil in the universe. Uh, now they're inconsistent, but they're still right. A good God seeing the evil of the world would in fact do something about it. <laughs> they just missed it when it happened. Jesus did, in fact, come into the world. A good God came into the world to die for the sins of the world, and the atheists missed it. Uh, bad on them. But they're right. There is evil in the world. Secondly, <coughs> God cannot be self-caused. That's actually a really important point. 
Uh, some theists have tried to argue that God caused himself, but that's clearly irrational. Uh, uh, to be a self-caused being, he would have to both exist and not exist at the same time. That's irrational. Uh, there are really only two kinds of being, the uh, uh, necessary and the contingent. Uh, a contingent being uh, might not exist and doesn't need to exist. Uh, um, I have a birthday. And before that, I didn't exist. Now I do. So I actually do exist. I don't need to, but the fact that I do means that I am caused by another. And ultimately, that other <coughs> is part of a long string of causes that has to go back to an original first cause. That's, a, that's an idea that goes all the way back to the early philosophers. Okay, positive human values. Uh, many atheists are also humanists. Uh, so they affirm the value of man and of human culture. Many of them pursue arts and sciences and they have their concerns about ethics. Uh, and, uh, so you, you have to applaud that as far as it goes. And then fourth, and I consider this probably the uh, primary purpose purpose of atheists in the world. Uh, they serve as a kind of a loyal opposition. And I use the term loyal loosely. Atheists serve as the opposition, as the resistance to theism. It's difficult to develop a strong logical position if you never hear any counter arguments. And atheist arguments help believers to clarify and sharpen their own arguments. Uh, frankly, atheist arguments never, never change my ultimate position, particularly. Uh, they, never, uh, they never really convince me, uh, but they make me think. Okay, some critiques. Uh, first, <clears throat> a finite cause does in fact need an infinite cause. Uh, an, an endless circle of finite causes in the real world is nonsense. Uh, try to imagine an infinite parking lot, for example, or an infinite library. Uh, and and if, you've, if you've got an infinite parking lot, there's always room for one more car. But if it lacks that one more car, it's not infinite. Uh, it's, it's a stupid idea. An infinite library has all of the, an infinite number of books, but how big a library would it have, would it have to be infinitely big? But if it's infinitely big, it's always got room for one more book. It's an irrational idea. Uh, the, uh, the idea of <coughs> infinity is kind of useful in mathematics. Uh, so if I've got a bookshelf that's eight feet long, there are uh, mathematically an infinite number of points uh, between one end and the other. But if I start to put books on that shelf, in other words, if I start to do something in the real world, uh, I'm going to have a limited number of books on the shelf. There can't be an infinite number of causes. And the first cause can't be self-caused because that's irrational. So it must be uncaused or necessary. In other words, the, the first cause of all contingent causes must itself always exist necessarily. And that goes all the way back to Plato and uh, the other early philosophers. Uh, the cause of the universe needs to be perfect. There has to be, if there were no perfect standard, uh, by which we could measure things, we, wouldn't, we couldn't judge any of them to be imperfect. To say that a thing is imperfect is to imply that we know the perfect. Uh, and so for people to say, well, the world is imperfect and our job is to make it better. Well, how do you know? Uh, the, ultimately, God is perfect. And to the extent that we fall short of the glory of God, we've got imperfections. Chance does not explain things very well. An intelligent cause is needed. Uh, an explosion uh, in a uh, parts factory uh, does not produce uh, a new Porsche sports car. Uh, and we all know that. 
Uh, the evidence for intelligent design is everywhere. Random chance, even over billions of years, simply can't explain the complexity of a single cell, let alone the whole universe. Uh, the idea evolution rests on a stupid idea. Uh, theists believe it's absurd to deny causality uh, because that would imply that nothing caused something, <laughs> but that doesn't work. You can't get nothing from nothing. Something produces something. Uh, and to say that the universe exists just all by itself without a cause uh, is to either assign deity to the universe, which some do, uh, or is to say the uh, utterly absurd. <clears throat> Uh, it's not possible to have an actually infinite series of causes. Okay, we looked at that before. It's logically possible that nothing ever existed. Okay, true. Uh, and including a necessary being. It's logically conceivable. However, if anything is actually found to exist, then it follows that it has a cause that is necessary. And this necessary being must, of course, exist. This is Rene Descartes around 1700. Descartes said, uh, uh, I, I doubt, I doubt everything. Uh, I doubt that flower exists. I doubt that that lamp pole exists. I doubt that the world exists. I doubt that I exist. Wait, <laughs> you can try this at home. Try to deny your own existence. Uh, and then ask yourself, who said that? <laughs> it is, in fact, impossible to deny your own existence. Uh, and because I, I exist, I actually do exist, and yet I am a possible being, not a necessary being. If anything, including myself, is found to exist, then it follows that there is a cause and that cause ultimately must be necessary. A necessary cause does, in fact, exist. So the universe as a whole does, in fact, require a cause. Uh, there are really only three kinds of things, the one of which is impossible, caused by another, which is just about everything, a self-caused being, which is irrational, or an uncaused thing, a thing that simply is. If there are any actual contingent things like you and I, then there's necessarily an uncaused first cause of that contingent thing. <laughs> I know it sounds complicated, but it really isn't. Uh, the argument from evil fails. Okay, a good God would want the evil gone, a powerful God would make it go away, but evil exists, so no God. This assumes omniscience. For one thing, how does the atheist know that anything is evil? By whose standard? But how can the atheist know that evil has no good purpose or that it will never be defeated? <clears throat> the Bible is clear about this. Romans 8.28 is one of the uh, primary sources here. We know that God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are the called according to his purpose. Does God have a purpose in the universe? Yes. Uh, can evil be defeated? Yes. Uh, is God in the process of doing that? Yes. Uh, and what does the atheist have to say about it? He doesn't like it. And uh, my answer is, that's tough. <laughs> your, your, your position is irrational. Uh, the summary, atheism, for all of its erudition, has not proven its major contention, that God does not exist. Atheists may still believe the principles of atheism, but they really should recognize that the door is still open for the existence of God. They haven't proved anything. Uh, if they want to believe an irrational position, like there is no God, they're welcome to that. It's a, it's a free world. 
Uh, and you're free in your own mind to believe the, the most foolish things you want to, as are demonstrated every day in the newspapers. Uh, but uh, the atheists cannot prove their contention. Uh, they're simply wrong. If they choose to believe in the principles of atheism, they should admit it for what it is, a kind of religion that they've made up. Uh, and um, they won't, of course. Uh, but that's all it is. That's all it ever could be. Uh, it's a, uh, a, a made up religion to avoid the responsibilities that God has placed on us all. So that's atheism. Uh, and uh, uh, as, I've, uh, as I've mentioned, uh, atheists are hard to have conversation with. Uh, they, uh, they tend to believe in their own righteousness no matter what. Uh, and they tend not to want to pay attention to anybody else's argument. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I haven't had good luck in arguing with, uh, with atheists, uh, uh, but I have had uh, pretty decent luck in uh, treating atheists with some compassion. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm willing to listen to them. Uh, uh, and I'll, I'll tell them that their argument is absurd, but that they're, they're perfectly free to hold to an absurd argument if that makes them feel better. <laughs> uh, atheists don't come around typically. Uh, uh, they, uh, they don't uh, come over to the Christian side of the aisle unless God does a special work. Uh, they don't come because our arguments are better. Uh, sometimes they'll come around because we love them. Uh, so that's our, that, that's our ammunition. Uh, let me, oh, let's see, where is my thing? This all, always gets difficult. I'm going to call it a day. Uh, we're going to be back next, uh, next Wednesday. And uh, we'll look at uh, uh, an ancient, ancient and still very widespread religion and philosophy and worldview that we call pantheism. Pantheism is the, uh, uh, the assertion that everything is God. You and I and that rock over there are all God. The, uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the force is a universal energy field that uh, uh, exists in all living things and gives the Jedi his strength. That's what we'll look at next week. It's kind of fun. Uh, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see some more then. In the meantime, uh, good to see everybody. Uh, uh, I look forward to uh, being able to see you all in person. Bye-bye now. Bye, Don. Yeah. Bye, Oscar. Thanks. Bye, Roger. Hey, see you, Mike. Yeah, Roger there. Yeah, yeah Joan, I see you. And, uh, Joan and Joan. And, uh, Buonasera, yeah, buongiorno. I see Valores and Willie is there. And uh, oh, Christy, bye bye. Bye bye, everybody. We'll see you next time. Love y'all. Stop. Bye.